Hi all, we are PTE for sure. We are providing complete training to successfully crack PTE exam with your desired score. We will provide you tips and tricks to get 65 and 79 in PTE. After enrolling, our course's material would be provided online. For more information, kindly contact through WhatsApp or other details mentioned in the video. When you think of a leader, you may think of an individual who is above all bold. But a new study of fish called sticklebacks shows that shy individuals actually prefer to follow fish that are similarly timid. Researchers had trios of sticklebacks with known personalities play follow the leader. The fish were placed in a tank that had some plastic plants at one end and some food hidden at the other. In some of the groups, a bold fish and a shy fish acted as leaders while another shy fish followed. And in other groups, it was a bold fish that did the following. The researchers recorded whether the follower sallied forth more frequently with the fish that was behaviorally similar or the one that was different. What they found is that shy fish were more likely to emerge from undercover when an equally wary fellow was already out there. Bold follower fish did not seem to care which leader they followed. Of course, no matter which fish a stickleback chose to stick with, the bold fish did lead more expeditions over the course of the experiment than their more retiring friends. That's because the bold fish initiated more trips, regardless of who might be tailing them. The findings are in the journal Biology Letters. The researchers write that when offered a choice of leaders, sticklebacks prefer to follow individuals whose personality matches their own. But bolder individuals may, nevertheless, be able to impose their leadership, even among shy followers, simply through greater effort. We may soon see if such tendencies also hold true in humans, when Americans decide who they'll follow in November. Unless, of course, something fishy happens. The special theory of relativity was developed by Albert Einstein in spring of 1905 and the space has a perhaps five intense weeks of thought, where he rewrote our understanding of space and time. Newton had given us an understanding of space and time back in the late 1600s which is very intuitive. It's the way we all think about space and time. Here is space. It's just this environment where things happen. And time is this relentless thing that ticks forward on our watches, our clocks, taking us moment after moment second after second into the future in a completely uniform, absolute and unchanging way. In special relativity Einstein said that's not right. He said space and time can change depending upon how you move. He showed that if you are moving, relative to somebody else, time for you slows down. And these kinds of revolutionary ideas are not simply esoteric pen and paper type understandings of the universe. You can take a little particle called a muon which if it's sitting in front of you will self-destruct and in about a million of a second it will fall apart. You take that particle and you make it go fast in one of these particle accelerators. It zips around near the speed of light. Because this moving time for it slows down. It doesn't just live for a million of a second. It lives for a second or a longer and a million times longer than it would if it's sitting in front of you. If you can put a person in one of these accelerators, they wouldn't live 80 years. They might live 80 million years as we are watching them because time for them slows down. This is one picture that you probably you all know what it is when you see it. It's a familiar looking image. Something probably we all have some personal experience with, right? This is a chest x-ray that would be taken in your doctor's office, for example, or a radiologist's office. And it is a good example of biomedical engineering and that it takes a physical principle, that is how x-rays interact with the tissues of your body, and it uses that physics that physical principle to develop a picture of what's inside your body, 
so to look inside and see things that you couldn't see without this device. And you'll recognize some parts of the image, you can see the rib cage here, the bones you can see the heart is the large bright object down here. If you have good eyesight from the distance, you can see the vessels leading out of the heart and into the lungs, and the lungs are darker spaces within the rib cage. We can ask two fundamental questions about animal behavior, they refer to as proximate and ultimate. Proximate questions are those concerned with the mechanisms that bring about behavior, ultimate questions are those concerned with the evolution of behavior. We can divide the proximate and ultimate questions into two sub-questions. For proximate, how does the behavior develop and secondly what causes the behavior? For ultimate, you can ask how did the behavior evolve? And secondly what is the adaptive significance of the behavior, what's its purpose? Together these comprise what are called Tinbergen's four questions about animal behavior. Nico Tinbergen was one of the founding fathers of the study of animal behavior. These questions represent the different ways of studying animal behavior and understanding the difference between those four questions are fundamental to understanding behavior and indeed the whole of biology. How do we study animal behavior? Well that depends on the type of question we're hoping to answer. Computer scientist Shwetak Patel and his team are developing new sensing systems. The initial focus was really around energy and water monitoring. They built a new generation of smart sensors that monitor electronic interference on a home's power line or water pressure changes in the plumbing. Most of this technology has already found industrial applications, and Patel and his team turned their attention to adapting the technology for personal health monitoring. So how do we take this noise and make it into a signal interest was hard to us, hard to us in the core of what we did for many years and we're taking that work and applying it to other domains. They're looking to take advantage of all the functionality built in our smartphones. With the user's permission, this app can use the microphone built into most smartphones to listen to background noises, such as coughing searching for patterns that suggest a trip to the doctor might be in order. We've constructed these models that try and understand how sound works, how it, what its patterns are and we give it a whole bunch of examples of different kinds of audio, things like people talking, Things like people laughing, sneezing and of course coughing. This app uses the phone's camera to check hemoglobin levels in blood by analyzing the color of capillary fluid through the skin. Generally, what happens is if you're anemic, your bloods may be a little less red and we take advantage of that by putting your finger over a camera of a phone. The camera of the phone can actually see the coloration of the blood. And this test uses the camera to tell parents worrying about jaundice and newborn infants. Now. Jaundice is something that doctors who has seen tons of babies, you just can figure out on a very basic level of it. Is this baby, do they need to get treatment or are they in a good condition? While the first time parent has no idea necessarily what jaundice might look like. The researchers say the built-in sensors found in smartphones are already commonplace, but their applications and their implications for our health and well-being may be more far-reaching than we ever imagined. The Earth's temperature is rising. And as it does, springtime phenomena like the first bloom of flowers, are getting earlier and earlier. But rising temperatures aren't the only factor. Urban light pollution is also quickening the coming of spring. So temperature and light are really contributing to a double whammy of making everything earlier. Richard French Constant, an entomologist at the University of Exeter. He and his colleagues compiled 13 years of data from citizen scientists in the UK, who tracked the first bud burst of four common trees. It turns out, light pollution, from streetlights in cities, and along roads, 
pushed bud burst a full week earlier. Way beyond what rising temperatures could achieve. This disruptive timing can ripple through the ecosystem. The caterpillars that feed on trees are trying to match the hatching of their eggs to the timing of bud burst. Because the caterpillars want to feed on the juiciest and least chemically protected leaves. And it's not just the caterpillars, of course, that are important. But the knock-on effect is on nesting birds, which are also trying to hatch their chicks at the same time that there's the maximum number of caterpillars. So earlier buds could ultimately affect the survival of birds, and beyond. The findings are in the proceedings of the Royal Society B. Wilson came from a different world. And he became the focal point of a bored mainstream American culture that thought that modern literature and wanted modern literature to be able to be read and appreciated by ordinary people. They were not modernists in an abstract sense. And certainly some of them like T.S. Eliot and Faulkner were too difficult for some of their writings to be read by ordinary people. But this was a world before the division between the brows or between the lead and whatever had established itself as a part of our consciousness. Wilson was a major player in the successful effort of his generation to establish at the heart of American life and innovative literature that would equal the great cultures of Europe. And he knew that the great cultures of Europe were there. He was not a product of a narrow American studies kind of training at all. He joined a high artistic standard with openness to all experience and a belief that literature was as much of a part of life for everyone as conversation. He thought the Proust and Joyce and Yeats and Eliot could and should be read by ordinary Americans and helped that to happen. Wilson was a very various man. Over a period of almost fifty years, he was a dedicated, a literary journalist, and an investigative reporter, a brilliant memoirist, and dedicated journal keeper. His biography, Biographical Histories to the Finland Station and Patriotic Gore are profoundly influential with Americans today. If you like our video kindly subscribe our channel and also press the low bell icon. Thank you.